Okay, Erev Tov, everybody. We'll get started, hopefully, on a happier topic for those, and I uh, and, uh, want to welcome everybody again. Just make mention that um, Monday, I will have Rav Amnam Bazak, a Rebbe at Gush Etzion, and we'll be giving another another shir. He spoke live before Pesach. He gave a shir Bivrit. He's very good. Um, and uh, like I said, he's a Ram at uh, Yeshiva at Haritz. So he'll be giving a shir on uh, Nes Pachashemen, um, shall Eliyahu Elisha and the Maccabim. So that'll be one o'clock on Monday. Um, then, then we have all our regular slate of Shirim. Okay, Dr. Sokolo, let's see how uh, the canonization of the Bible, let's see how uh, our holy books came together. Vakasha. Okay. Um, so uh, you may recall that uh, the very close of last week's class, uh, somebody uh, mentioned the word octatok. Um, so I uh, dutifully uh, looked up octatok. Uh, I found octatok, but I found no particular reference to octatok and Yemenites, which was the specific reference. Uh, so uh, whoever it is, uh, if you can uh, refer me to a source, I, I will be glad to look at it. But um, a baby Israel, uh, not uh, Yemenite. Pardon? The Jews of India, not the Jew Yemenites. Well, it's at it, the bottom, it, it doesn't show up any place any in anything Jewish. I haven't found. Uh, if I appreciate it, I say just send me whatever the reference is. Uh, I could not come up with any uh, combination of Octatuk and anything that is specifically Jewish. Um, we talk about the Penta, talk, Penta being Greek for five, a Torchos being a book. And by that, we refer to the Chamisha Chumshe Torah. The Samaritans, uh, that is to say, the people who uh, were moved from Asia Minor into the land of Israel, uh, just as the 10 tribes of Northern Israel were being moved to Asia Minor, uh, keep what is called a Hexa talk. Uh, that is six books, because in addition to the five books of Moses, they also uh, consider canonical the uh, book of Joshua. So as you the see- The Jewish in name for it is the Arit. Is a reference to eight books, and that would combine the five books of the Torah along with the book of Joshua. And it says two more, the book of Judges and the book of Ruth. The only observation I would make on that is that we did already refer to the fact when we spoke about uh, Josephus, who spoke about 22 books in the Jewish Bible, and we were speculating on whether he had only 22 and two more were yet to be canonized, or whether perhaps the canon consisted of 22 books where in two cases, two books were combined together. And we suggested that one of the possibilities would be the combination of the book of Judges with the book of Ruth. So you can see that reflected here in the description of the Octatuk, because in addition to the five books of the Torah and the book of Joshua, they also consider canonical the book of Judges and the book of Ruth. So again, that association of the book of Judges Shoftim with the book of Ruth shows up here too. Okay, and with that, uh, I'd like to move on. So once again, uh, we're into our second uh, discussion of canonization. And again, just to remind you, I figure if I show this at the beginning of every week's class, then by the time we're done, hopefully, if nothing else, you will have committed to memory the names of the 24 books of the Bible. So here, once again, we have the five books of the Torah, Bereshit, Shemot, Vayikra, Bimidbar, and Devarim known by their Latin or Greek names, Genesis, the book of beginnings or origins, Exodus, the book of leaving Egypt, Leviticus, the book that deals with the rules of the Kohanim and the Leviim, Numbers, the book of census, and Deuteronomy, Mishneh Torah, where many of the laws are repeated. And then we have the eight books of Nevi'im divided into four books that are called Nevi'im Rishonim, and those would be the books of Yahushua, Shofetim, Shemuel, and Melachim, and four books that are called the later prophets, Nevi'im Acharonim, and those are the more, more classical prophets, Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkel, and an anthology that combines the works of 12 Nevi'im 
as I said again, it's called minor prophets, minor not reflecting their importance, but only reflecting their size. Then we come to the remaining 11 books of Ketuvim, which are again divided into Ketuvim Gedolim and Ketuvim Ketanim. And here again, it's pretty much a function of size. The Ketuvim Gedolim are the book of Tehillim, the has the largest number of chapters of any book in the Bible, 150, um, Mishlei and Eov. And then the Ketuvim Ketanim are subdivided, five of them, because they, the uh, custom has arisen for them to be read on specific holidays. They are grouped together in the order in which they are read, and they are known collectively as the Megillot, even though, as we've already pointed out, the only one of the five to actually be called the Megillah in the Talmud is the Book of Esther. And then finally, at the end, we have the last three books of the Bible, Daniel, uh, the combined books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and the uh, Book of Chronicles. Okay. Now, um, we last week looked at uh, what I call the historical sources for canonization reference to canonization or to, uh, to holy books in the works of uh, Philo, um, in, the, uh, in the works of Josephus. Uh, and now we're moving to rabbinic sources for canonization. And here are two terms, uh, technical terms, that we have to uh, recognize in order to deal with the subject of canonization in rabbinic literature. The first is the word geniza. Uh, literally means concealment, and it simply refers to the fact that there was a practice, uh, may very well still exist in some form, but that we have evidence that during the rabbinic period there was a practice wherein texts that were rejected from the canon okay, were deliberately concealed or sequestered. So a biblical, so a rabbinic source that discusses one of uh, discusses a book and raises the question, should this book be placed in a geniza, is essentially a text that is reflecting on the process of canonization. If the book did not succeed in becoming part of the canon, then it was concealed. However, if it succeeded in becoming part of the canon, then another technical term was applied to it. And the second technical term is tumat yadayim, the defilement of the hands. And that is a reflection of the fact that books um, or scrolls that contain parts or all of genuine biblical books were regarded by the rabbis as uh, imparting tumat yadayim. Now, uh, as I define it here, Tumat Yadayim is a minor, rabbinically imposed degree of ritual impurity. It's minor because unlike a major form of defilement, like Tumat Mate, coming into contact with a corpse, which requires, uh, well, it, biblically it would require the sprinkling of the ashes of the para duma, but let's talk about not necessarily a first degree of defilement, even a second degree of defilement, would require minimally immersion in a mikvah. Tumat yadayim only requires washing the hands. Okay, so in that respect, it's a minor degree of ritual impurity. The question as to why the rabbis imposed this degree of ritual impurity on scrolls is a matter of speculation, but there is evidence to suggest the following, and that is that it would seem that people were accustomed to keeping whatever holy scrolls they had in the same place in which they kept something else that was holy. What did your average householder have that was holy? Now, assuming that most people in those days were uh, engaged in agriculture, then you would assume that what people would have, what ordinary people might have in their possession 
which could be considered holy, was grain that they had set aside as truma. That is to say, a small percentage of the grain harvested in a field that belonged to the Kohen. Now, when people harvested their field, they didn't necessarily have a Kohen handy to deliver the truma to them. So there would have to be a place at home where it could be stored until it could be delivered to the Kohen. So that storage place was recognized even by ordinary people as a place in which you keep something that's holy. And it would seem that if people had in their possession scrolls of holy books, then they were accustomed to storing the holy books in the same place that they stored the grain that was to be delivered to the Kohanim. As the Gemara says, they would say, Hai Kodesh Vahai Kodesh. One of them, the grain, is sanctified because it belongs to the Kohen. The scrolls are sanctified because the texts that are written on them are part of the Tanakh. And therefore, they would be stored in the same place which was an invitation to the indiscriminate field mice, which would be attracted by the grain. And once they made their way into the area in which the grain was stored, they would nibble and gnaw away at the scrolls as well. Therefore, what happened is that the scrolls would be damaged or destroyed by the mice who were attracted by the grain. So what did Tumat Yadayim accomplish? What Tumat Yadayim accomplished is that if you declared that these scrolls, scrolls on which biblical texts were written, gave off Tumat, then you couldn't store them together with the Truma. And once people started separating their truma and their scrolls, the scrolls stood a better chance of preservation. So let us now look at, at some of the sources, some that use the term geniza to indicate that a text is not part of Tanakh. And then we'll look at some sources that discuss whether certain texts give off this tuma, whether they impart which would indicate that they were considered canonical. So here we start with a Mishnah. The Mishnah says as follows, tells a story, Ma'aseh, once upon a time, Kohen Echad Shaya Mit'aseh, there was a particular Kohen who was making himself busy. And apparently, where was he? Uh, where was he busy? He was busying himself in the temple, and he noticed that a part of the floor in the temple was different from the rest of the floor. And he came and he reported this to another kohen, and he probably said to him, "Hey, take a look. This piece of flooring." looks different from the rest. I wonder why, okay? Says the Mishnah, lo hispik ligmor et hadavar. He didn't even have the opportunity to finish, meaning to maybe raise that piece of floor and to see why it was different. Ad sheyatsetan nishmato. He died. Viyadu. Why? Biyichud. Then people around knew for certain, Shesham, that it was on that site, Ha'aron Nignaz. Now, one of the Mishnah tells us that there was no Aaron Kodesh in the second temple. It, it's not 100% clear from the biblical text at what point in earlier biblical history was the ark taken captive, so to speak. It may have happened early, relatively early during the time of, of, a, of Paro Necho. It may have happened during a later time, during one of the evasions by the Assyrians. 
but it seems to be rather certain that at some point in time, the Aron, the Ark, either was removed forcibly from the temple and never returned, or in, in order to prevent it being taken away, it was hidden. The point of this text, of course, is just simply to show the use of the word nignaz. When you want to conceal something, when you want to essentially remove it from circulation, then the term that is applied to it is geniza. Okay. And here we have a similar use of the term. The story says as follows. Amar Rabbi Yossi. Again, ma'aseh, another story. Ma'aseh ba'aba chalafta she'alach etzel rabban gamliel b'rebi litveria. A story about a certain sage named Abba Chalafta who went to pay a visit to Rabban Gamliel, who was the Nasi, the prince and the head of the Sanhedrin in Tiberias. And when he arrived, what was Rabban Gamliel doing? He was seated at a table, and he was holding Sefer Iyov Targum. He was holding a Targum, which likeliest, uh, the likeliest uh, uh, significance would be that this was an Aramaic translation of the biblical book of Eov, right? Vuhu Korebo. And Rabban Gamliel was studying this text. Amarlo, so Rabbi ha Abba Chalafta said to Rabban Gamliel, Zachor ani Rabban Gamliel avi avicha. I happen to recall an instance in which your grandfather, who was also named Rabban Gamliel, haya omed agav ma'ala bahar habayit. He was standing on the slope of the Temple Mount. Veheviu lefanav sefer iyov targum. And somebody approached him holding the same book, and not literally the same scroll, but a copy of the same book that you were sitting at the table and reading. That is to say, a copy of an Aramaic version of the biblical book of Eov. But how did your grandfather react? Amar Labanai, he said, he, gave, he instructed the mason, shika'ehu tachat hanidbach, bury it beneath, beneath the stones, meaning, Rabban Gamliel, the elder Rabban Gamliel, considered this text something that needed to be concealed, that needed to be taken out of circulation. And how did he remove it from circulation? He had it buried. So when Rabban Gamliel the younger heard this story, what was his reaction? Afhut siva alav ugenazo. He kind of said, whoops, you know? And he gave instructions that the text that he had been reading from should be treated similarly. It should be concealed. So once again, we get the impression that texts that are to be removed from circulation are to be concealed, and that there are a variety of different means of concealing them. But a likely one was that they could be hidden, they could be buried in a structure. Okay. Now, let's come to a source in which the concept of Geniza is applied to a text that we consider to be biblical. A very famous Gemara in Masechet Shabbat tells us Bikshu Chachamim Lignoz Sefer Kohelet, that the uh, sages sought to conceal the book of Kohelet. Now, the book of Kohelet is part of Tanakh. So we know at the outset that their efforts to conceal it were, uh, that their efforts were in vain. Okay? But the question arises, why would they even contemplate concealing it? So the Talmud tells us the reason, because in their study of the book of Kohelet, they found verses in Kohelet 
that contradicted one another. And perhaps it was their impression that biblical texts have to be uniform and therefore maybe even almost by definition, a text that contains contradictions could not be divinely inspired, okay? But as I said at the outset, we know that they were unsuccessful. Therefore, mipnei mad lo genazuhu, that if they felt that they had adequate reason to conceal it because it contained contradictions, then why nevertheless does it remain part of Tanakh? And the answer is an interesting one. Mipnei shetchilato divrei Torah v'sofo divrei Torah. And their answer is because apparently they reconciled themselves to the fact that a book could be divinely inspired and still have contradictions in it, providing that the general tenor of the book was religious. And since the book of Kohelet both begins and ends on a note of, on a religious note, Havel Havalim Amar Kohelet, Havel Havalim HaKol Havel, that all things that are not spiritual, all things that are not religious are vain, and that all material things are vain, the accumulation of wealth, the accumulation of wisdom, and that at the end, sof davar hakol nishma, at the final analysis, et ha Elohim yira, that mitzvotav shemor, one should get through life through one's belief in God and observance of mitzvot, Therefore, they considered the book to be a religious book, and they were prepared to keep it in the Tanakh in spite of its contradictions. And indeed, the Gemara tells us, the Av Sefer Mishle Bikshulig knows that Kohelet wasn't the only biblical book that was subjected to this discussion and to the contemplation of removing it from the Bible and concealing it but that they treated the book of Mishle the same way. For the what reason? The same reason, because it too contains contradictions. So far, we have reference to two biblical books that were considered for Geniza. Now we learn that there was a third. The Gemara and Chagiga tells us Amar of Yehuda, Bram, indeed, Zahur Oto Ha'ish Litov. We have to remember a particular individual uh, fondly. Who was that individual? Hananya ben Chizkia. Why? Il Malehu, because were it not for him, Nignaz Sefer Yechezkel, the book of Yechezkel would have been concealed. That is to say, it wouldn't be part of Tanakh. Why? Here is a somewhat stronger argument, not because it contained verses that were mutually exclusive of one another, but because shahayu devarab soturin divrei Torah, because words in Yechezkel contradicted those of the Torah. I don't want to get into too great detail here because it is somewhat abstruse. But a good number of chapters in the book of Yechezkel, particularly towards the end of the book, describe how the temple is going to be rebuilt. Remember that Yechezkel lived in Babylonia during the time of the Babylonian exile. So he talks about how the temple, this what we call the second temple, was going to be built. And he talks about how the avodah, how the service of God, the sacrificial service, was going to be renewed in the rebuilt temple. And in the process, not all the details about the construction of the temple match those that we would expect from the earlier description of the first temple. And not all of what he talks about, how the sacrifices will be offered in the second temple, match what we were led to believe or what we might presume based on the Torah's description of sacrifices. So because they found these verses in Yechezkel that appear to contradict the Torah, the sages or some sages were of the opinion 
that it should be removed. It should not be part of the Bible, and rather it should be concealed. Now, that's again, just as in the cases of Kohelet and Mishle, we know that Yechezkel survived this discussion, and it is part of Tanakh. So what happened? The story continues. Me'asa. So what did Hananya ben Chezkiya do that he earned Rabbi Yehuda's approbation? He'elulo shlosh me'ot gareve shemen. V'yashav ba'aliyah u'derasho. This Hananya ben Chezkiya was apparently a, a Talmid Chacham, and he sat at home in an attic room, that's an aliyah, in an attic room, and he managed to resolve all of the contradictions that people had spotted between the book of Yechezkel and the Torah. And apparently, by implication, there were many such contradictions, and apparently they were serious contradictions and required a considerable amount of deliberation and discussion. And therefore the reference to the 300 measures of oil seems to suggest that it took him quite a while to do it, so much so that he didn't leave his room and therefore supplies, provisions had to be brought to him so that he could continue in his work uninterrupted. But again, for our purposes, the principal focus is again on the uh, use of the term nignaz to signify something that should not be biblical, but rather it should be concealed. Now, as we said, the flip side of the canonical coin from nignaz is metameya tayadayim, to defile the hands. And that books that successfully passed the inspection and were considered part of Tanakh were considered to impart this minor form of Tum'ah. As I said, the speculation is in order to make sure that they would not be stored uh, let's put it into the positive, to make sure that they would be preserved separate from anything else in order to guarantee their preservation. And this is all a derivative of a famous Mishnah in Masechet Yadayim. Masechet Yadayim is the next to the last uh, Masechet of Mishnah in the Shisha Sidre Mishnah. And the Mishnah says as follows, General rule, Kitve HaKodesh, Holy Scriptures, Mitam in etayadayim. If you touch them, you can't touch them with, with dirty hands, you can't touch them with wet hands. You have to wash your hands and dry them before touching them. Bearing in mind that not only will this, uh, will this mean that you will uh, see to their proper storage and preservation, but it also means that the scrolls are not going to get dirty, that people are going to be careful in handling the scrolls, which is also a way to ensure their preservation. Then the Mishnah says, Shir Hashirim v'kohelet mitam inet hayadayim. Now, there are 24 books of Tanakh. So once you've said that all the Kitve Kodesh defile the hands, why do you have to mention any of them in particular? So it would seem to imply that the reason that they single out Shir Hashirim and Kohelet to tell us that they too defile the hands is clearly because like the books that we've seen previously, like Kohelet and like Mishle and like Yechezkel, the books of Shir Hashirim, well, Kohel we already mentioned, Shir Hashirim, would also seem to, at one point or another, to have been subject to question. But then as we continue in the Mishnah, we see that it's not so clear. Rabbi Yehuda has a different opinion. Rabbi Yehuda says, Shira Shirim mitameyataya dayim, meaning unquestionably, Shira Shirim is biblical, it's canonical, okay? 
Kohelet, says Rabbi Yehuda, machloket. Okay? Meaning that there's a difference of opinion. There's a dispute regarding the canonical status of Kohelet. Rabbi Yossi goes even further. Rabbi Yossi says, Kohelet? No way. A no Kohelet is not canonical. Bishirashirim machloket. And the reason that the Mishnah singles out Shirashirim is because it was the subject of a dispute. Rabbi Shimon offers a note of clarification, and that is Kohelet Mikule Beit Shamai Umechumre Beit Hillel, that the status of the book of Kohelet is one of those things in which the house of Shammai was lenient and the house of Hillel was stringent, which is actually the opposite of what we are accustomed to. We customarily think of Hillel as being um, the uh, more open and embracing character. And therefore we think of the school of Hillel as being more lenient. While, while Shammai is usually thought of as being uh, haughty and, and, and quick to quick tempered, and therefore the house of Shammai is generally considered to be more stringent. And therefore Rabbi Shimon points out that in this case, the canonical status of the book of Kohelet uh, flipped it around. Beit Shammai said, oh, Kohelet, it's fine. And Beit Hillel are the ones who said, Kohelet, no way. Shimon ben Azai said, Mikubalani mi pi ayin Beit Zaken. He said, I have a tradition that comes from the 72 elders. 72 elders is basically a euphemism for the Sanhedrin. And he's saying that he has a tradition that the Sanhedrin ruled on this question. That on the day that they appointed Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah to replace Rabban Gamliel as the Nasi, as the prince, and as the head of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin took a decision now, of course, we know that already because that's how the Mishnah began. The Mishnah began by stipulating that Shira Shirim and Kohelet defile the hands. So what Rabbi Shimon ben Azai is doing, he's simply telling us that indeed, up to a certain point in time, one or the other of these two books was subject to a dispute, meaning its canonical status was disputed. But at a certain point in historical time, a decision was rendered, and from that point on, they clearly remain canonical. For our purposes, all we need to do is to identify this period in time. And the period of time, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, is pretty much the first half of the second century. So it seems to imply that into the middle of the second century of the common era, the canonical process was still ongoing. And that only at some point in the middle of the second century was there a definitive decision made about which books are canonical and which books are not. That, as I said, might very well help us out in the question that we raised last week about Josephus, where once again, Josephus spoke of 22 books in the biblical canon. And while we speculated that there might, his 22 might be the same as our 24, we also raised the possibility that in the first century of the common era, in Josephus's lifetime, only 22 books had been admitted to the canon, and that perhaps there were two more books that were only admitted later. Theoretically, it's possible that those two books were Shira Shirim and Kohelet, that somehow in the middle of the first century, by the time of the rebellion against Rome, they had not been admitted to the canon, 
but a hundred years later, by the time of Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, they were admitted to the canon. The Mishnah ends with a declaration by Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva says, no way. Chas v'shalom. Lo nechlak adam Yisrael asher hashirim shalot tamei atayadayim. Rabbi Akiva says it is impossible that anyone ever doubted the canonical status of Shir Hashirim. And he goes even further and he says, She'en kol ha'olam kulo kedai ki yom shenitan bo shir hashirim li Yisrael. He says that all of existence basically pales in comparison to the day on which Shir Hashirim was composed. Shekol ketuvim kodesh. Because if we have a collection of books that we consider to be holy, Shir Hashirim, says Rabbi Akiva, is Kodesh Kodashim, is the most sacred of them all. Ah, but we already saw in the previous slide three different opinions that said that there was a dispute concerning its canonical status. No, says Rabbi Akiva, you're mistaken. Imnech Laku, if there ever was a dispute, over the canonical status of a biblical book. It wasn't over the status of Shir Hashirim, Ela al Kohelet. It was only with regard to the canonical status of Kohelet. Uh, just to, to add parenthetically, uh, we would, this is something that we would expect from Rabbi Akiva. Shir Hashirim is, uh, as you know, uh, uh, traditionally regarded as a, um, an allegory for the relationship between God and the Jewish people. But the allegory presents the relationship between God and the Jewish people in terms of the, of the uh, love story between a shepherd and, and, I don't know if he was, she was a shepherd, this, between a shepherd and his beloved. And it's not surprising to find Rabbi Akiva defending the canonical status of Shir Hashirim because Rabbi Akiva was, and please uh, take this uh, in the, uh, in the uh, 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 sense that um, I, I, I want it to uh, be understood. Rabbi Akiva was the great lover. If you think about it, the things that we know most or best about Rabbi Akiva are all attached to the notion of love. Rabbi Akiva was in love with Rachel, with the daughter of Kalba Savua. His relationship with her is one of love. You may recall also, either from the Talmud or from the uh, liturgy of Yom HaKippurim, uh, that passage that talks about the Asara Harugei Malchut, the um, 10 scholars who were martyred uh, during the rebellion against Rome uh, in the second century of the Common Era, that while Rabbi Akiva was tortured, he was reciting Kriyat Shema, V'yatsa'a nishmato, and he died as he pronounced the word, V'yahavta et Hashem Elohecha b'chol levavcha u'v'chol nafshecha, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, love. So it's not surprising to find that Rabbi Akiva, who loved Rachel, that Rabbi Akiva, who loved God, that Rabbi Akiva, who used to say, what is a klal gadol b'torah? What did Rabbi Akiva consider to be the most important rule in the Bible? The ahavta l're'acha kamocha. Love your fellow as you would love for yourself. So as I said, not surprising to find that Rabbi Akiva defending, as it were, the honor of Shir Hashirim. Now, what happened to books that 
may at some point have been considered by some people eligible for inclusion in the Bible, but for one reason or another did not pass muster. So these books are known generically as the Apocrypha. The word apocryphal, as you know from English, means of doubtful authenticity. And it doesn't mean that these books were not authentic works of Jewish literature. It just means that they were not considered canonical. And um, the, the, uh, certainly the Orthodox Jewish tradition really does not pay these books any particular mind. It's largely in the traditions of uh, of Christian churches that we find uh, uh, that we find references to the Apocrypha. And, and I just simply chose uh, an illustration here. If you see uh, on the left hand side, it shows us that the uh, that the uh, the Tanakh, the uh, Jewish canon has three parts to it, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. But if you look at the Christian canon, the Christian canon consists of but what they call the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament consists of what the Jewish Tanakh calls the Torah. Some of the books that are called historical, basically some of what we call Nevi'im Rishonim, if you're looking now at the right-hand side of the page, some of the books of Nebiim Rishonim, Yehoshua, Shoftim, Shemuel, and Melachim, okay, along with some of the later books of Tanakh, Divrei Hayamim, Ezra, and Nehemiah. The Christian Old Testament also incorporates what it calls wisdom books, and these two are biblical texts, Iov, Tehilim, Mishlei, Kohelet, and Shira Shirim, as well as what, the, what are called prophetic books. And as you see, they too talk about major prophets and minor prophets, right? Yeshayahu, Yermiyahu, and of course, the book of Echa is attached to Yermiyahu, just as Rut is attached to Shoftim, Yechezkel and Daniel, and then the Treasar. But if you look back now on the left-hand side, the Christian Bible also contains books that they call deuterocanonical. Deuterocanonical means that they kind of are like reflections of some biblical books. And those include the books of Tovia, Yehudit, additions to the book of Esther, the books of Maccabees, a book that's called Chochmat Shlomo, the wisdom of Solomon, the book of Ben Sira. We're going to say more about that in just a moment the uh, book of Baruch, Baruch in this case being Baruch ben Neria, who was a scribe to the prophet Yirmiyahu, okay? And then there's some distinctions. The Orthodox Church has certain books that the, um, that the Latin Church doesn't consider canonical. And the very last reference uh, to Wahedo is the Ethiopic Church, and the Ethiopic Church can, can, can considers canonical some additional books that aren't even accepted by the Orthodox. So as I said, some books, Jewish books, books written by Jewish authors, some of them, the books that did not make it into Tanakh, made it into the Christian Bible. But Here's a very interesting case. The book of Ben Sira, okay? The Tosefta in Masechet Yadayim, and now we understand why it's in Masechet Yadayim, because we know that the concept of Tum'at Yadayim, of impurity, that is to say, something that is a quality or an attribute of biblical texts is discussed in the Mishnah in Yadayim. The Tosefta in Yadayim says, Hagil Yonim, the Sifrei Haminim, Gilyonim possibly be the Gospels, and other heretical books, Einan Metamot et Hayadayim. They're not part of the Jewish Bible. Then it says, Sifrei Ben Sira, the whole Sifarim Shenichtovu Mikan Va'elach, the book of Ben Sira, and all books that were written subsequently. Or similarly, non-canonical. 
Why is the book of Ben Sirah singled out? And here comes an interesting thing. Here's a passage from the Talmud. The passage says as follows, Amar le Rava le Rabba bar Mari. One Amora addressed another and asked him, Mina hamilta da amre inshe. What is the source of a popular saying? What is the popular saying? Look at the English. A bad palm, palm tree, will usually make its way to a grove of barren trees. Meaning, it will find its way to something similar to itself. Okay, right? You, a, a, a bad palm tree will make its way to a grove of barren trees. So what's the source of this notion? And he answers by saying, Davar zeh, this notion, the idea that bad things tend to keep each other's company, or if you wish, that like things seek the company of like things, he maintains, katuv betorah, it's mentioned in the Torah, shanui b'neviyim, it's repeated in the books of neviyim, umishulash baktuvim, and it's repeated for a third time in the ktuvim. Okay, now let's see what the proof texts are. Betorah, where does this idea appear in the Torah? It cites the verse, Vayelech Esav el Yishmael. Okay, Esav, one bad apple, went to keep the company of Yishmael, another bad apple. So that indeed is a Torah verse that suggests that like enjoys the company of like. Where is it repeated in Nevi'im? Dichtiv, another verse. That Yiftach, who started off life as a uh, ne'er do well, right, kept the company of Anashim Reikim, of people who had nothing else to do, of layabouts. So the idea that like enjoys the company of like is to be found in Nevi'im also. Where is it found in Kituvim? Look at the third citation. Okay. Dichtiv, kol of lemino yishkon. That birds keep the company, birds of a feather flock together. I was just saving that for the end. Uvne adam lidomelo. And similarly, people like to keep the company of people who are like themselves. You know what the problem is? I'll show you the problem, if I can. Mm. No, I'm sorry. It's not, not helping me. Uh, I was simply going to, I was simply going to take you to a, uh, take you to um, a, uh, an open box that I had a uh, search of a concordance just to show you that there is no verse in the, in the Hebrew Bible that contains these words. The words, right, call of lemino yishkon, that birds keep the company of similar birds, uvne adam domelo, and similarly people keep the company of those who resemble them. There's no such verse in the Bible. Where is there such a verse, however? There is such a verse in the book of Ben Sirah. Verse 14, kol habasar ye'ehav mino, not just birds, but all living things enjoy the company of their own kind. The chol adam et hadomelo. And likewise, people like enjoy the company of people who resemble themselves. So what do we find? we find that there was a book. The book of Ben Sirah was written in the, in the second century BCE. It was written by an Alexandrian Jew named Yehoshua or Yeshua Ben Sirah. And the book consists of proverbs, aphorisms, The grandson of the author 
translated the book into Greek. And in Greek, it became very popular, not only among Jews, but it became very popular amongst Gentiles as well. It became so popular in Greek that the Hebrew original of Ben Sira was lost for the better part of two millennia. You're going to have to tune in next week in order to hear about the recovery of the text of Ben Sira. But the point that I want to, re, um, to reiterate now before we close for this evening and I look at the chat is that we just saw a passage in the Talmud. The passage uses the technical terms that describe the three parts of the biblical canon. It says that there's something in the Torah, there's something in Nevi'im, and there's something in Ketuvim. And indeed, when it cites a verse and it calls it a Torah verse, that verse is in the Torah. When it cites a verse that it calls a prophetic verse, that verse is in one of our Nevi'im. It's in the book of Shofetim. But when it quotes a verse from Ben Sirah, it still calls it Mishulash Biktuvim, that it is reiterated in Ketuvim, as though the book of Ben Sirah was the equivalent of Tehillim, Mishle, Eov, or Kohelet. What this seems to imply is that when we saw those earlier sources in the Mishnan Yadayim and elsewhere, talking about how the sages in the second century of the common era were still debating whether certain books were canonical, that is to say, whether certain books were biblical or not biblical, it means that at an earlier point in time, a similar discussion had taken place, a similar discussion regarding the biblical status of the book of Ben Sira. And it seems indeed likely that the Talmudic passage that we just read is reflecting a point in time at which the book of Ben Sira, which would eventually, ultimately, be considered non-canonical, non-biblical, nonetheless, at some point in time, it was considered to be a biblical book. And that is why it not only was cited, what we'll see next week are several additional places in the Talmud where the book of Ben Sira is quoted, okay? Meaning even at a later point in time when the book of Ben Sira was clearly not considered part of the Bible, it was still considered to be an authentic and reliable Jewish book so that the sages of the Mishnah and the Talmud were able to quote it. They would, they would not any longer refer to it as though it were part of the Bible, but if they wanted to make a point and the point was served by a text from the book of Ben Sira, then they would cite the book of Ben Sira because it was considered an authoritative book. Not biblical, but authoritative nevertheless. Okay. Moshe? One second, I'll go by the chat. Chat, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, regular farmers, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the question of what was a, a biblical scroll uh, doesn't mean that they necessarily, first of all, uh, they could have had a Torah. It could be a farming community that, that kept a, a Torah. Um, it could be a farming community that kept one of the other biblical books. I, I don't see that it's, uh, that it's such a, a difficult thing to, to, um, to imagine. Um, concealed but not destroyed, yes. Um, was concealed because it was not considered authoritative but it was not, it didn't require destruction per se. Um, and I don't know that there was any implication that it was going to be used in the future. Uh, the idea more was that it would be concealed and it would therefore simply be removed from circulation. 
Um, not at all clear, as I said, what uh, uh, Sefer Iyov Targum means. Um, the more so that if you look at Ibn Ezra's commentary at the beginning of the third chapter of the book of Iyov, Ibn Ezra says something very odd. He says about the language of the book of Eov, Vahu Kashe, it's difficult. And indeed, the book of Eov may be the most difficult biblical book to penetrate um, philologically. Ibn Ezra says that, that, that the book of Eov is difficult. Because he implies, he suggests, or at least that's one way to read the text. He says that the book of Eov is so difficult because it's not an original text. It's a translation of another text. So there's some speculation as to whether what Rabban Gamliel concealed may have been the authentic original text of Eov, but that's beyond where we can go this evening. Chumre Bet Chilel means it's metamea tayadayim and part of Tanakh. Kohelet mikule Bet Shamayu me Chumre Bet Hillel. I said that Bet Shamay accepted it and Bet Hillel rejected it. And you're suggesting that it is just the opposite. I, I have to double check that. I have to double check that. I was pretty sure I had it right, but it's a good point. I will check it. Yes, thank you, birds of a feather flock together. As I said, I, I was saving it for the citation from, uh, from uh, Ben Sira. Okay. Um, interesting that later editors of the Talmud didn't feel a need to retract any reflection of Ben Sira as canonical. There's two rays. Yeah, as I said, we will see next week, we'll see some additional citations of Ben Sira. And then uh, I, I will, as I said, just spend a little time before we go further, uh, just talking about uh, the book of Ben Sira uh, and its uh, recovery uh, at the end of the 19th century. Thank and, you. By the way, yeah, by oh, the way, I, 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 I love your comment on uh, Rabbi Akiva and love. I always say Rabbi Akiva and hope, but now they go together. It's Rabbi Akiva, the end of Makwet, you know, that uh, he was laughing when the fox is, and it's Rabbi Akiva, the end of Yuma tells us, Shrechim Yisrael, don't worry, without a temple, God purifies you. And Rabbi Akiva is always symbol of hope. But I think you can put hope and love go together. I never really, you know, of course, we say it's so obvious, but I never really thought of it that way. That that was a that a beautiful point. And I think yes, um, M. Byrne, I think does want to speak up. So I'm sorry if I uh, Bakasha, unmute yourself and. Uh, I'm your unmute. Question. Can you hear me, Moshe? Yes, Marty. How are you? Uh, just an observation. Uh, you quoted when they brought down the Bensira, uh, and. Here, thereafter, any books from Ben Sira thereafter are not Metame Yadayim, but just from a, a chronological point of view, with the rabbis making a point that after the period of prophecy ceased, books, however legitimate they be, would be not, not be made a part of the, of the canon. I don't think it has anything to do with prophecy because prophecy, according to the rabbinic tradition, prophecy ceased hundreds of years before Ben Sira. Okay. The, the final prophets, the final prophets were Chagai, Zechariah, and Malachi. We're not really sure who Malachi is. There's a rabbinic tradition that identifies Malachi with Ezra, but that would still place him in the Persian era. Okay. The right. Persian era ended when Alexander the Great conquered the Middle East in the middle of the fourth century BCE. Okay. That would be 200 years before Ben Sira. So, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, as I said, the, the, if, indeed, if indeed we're reading the text correctly, and the implication is that Ben Sira was at some point considered for biblical status, it was considered eligible for biblical status, then it would make it abundantly clear that, that it was not necessary for a book to have been written by a recognized prophet in order mm -hmm. to make it into the Bible. Okay. okay, any other questions? If you want to unmute yourself, Vakasha. Otherwise, Dr. Sokolov will see you next week. I believe next week is Air of Thanksgiving, where you live. Um, where we live, it's uh, way past. Uh, you know, but anyways, thank you very much. We look forward to next week.
uh, tomorrow morning or tomorrow right at noon. Uh, Shuli Mishkin continues her series on uh, Israel, the, the medieval period for the Jews in the land of Israel. Um, and tomorrow, always a fascinating series. And tomorrow evening, the Parsha here, 8.30 from Memphis, Tennessee, from which Joel Finkelstein will be giving the Parsha to Shavush here. Then I'll be giving my Siddur Shear 9.30 Friday morning. Next week, our regular schedule, Allah Shearman, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Rav Amnon, Amnon Bazak, uh, one of the Rosh Yeshiva, one of the Ramim at Yeshiva Haratyon, will be giving uh, Yeshir on Neis Pacha Shemen Eliyahu Elisha and the Maccabim. So that's uh, Monday at 1 p.m. Okay, we'll look forward to seeing you. Rabbi, Rabbi, your sitter class on Friday, you said is 9 15. Next, no, next week, next week, next week, we're starting at 9 15. Oh, this week, it's 9 still at 9 30. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, this week, 9 30. Next week, because my, my teaching schedule changes. So, I have to, so I'll have to move the share 15 minutes earlier. Thank you very okay, much. Thank uh, yeah, you. But it, this week's still 9.30. I will email about that. Yes. Okay. Uh, please invite your friend. That is still your homework, as I say. Uh, some of you are good at it. Some of you, I'm still waiting to give you marks for inviting your friends to join. Uh, a, a, a share one friend. Uh, don't invite more. I mean, uh, I won't complain if you do. But just <laughs> one person to invite uh, to come on when I'm sure I'm trying the Torn Motion Zoom uh, Zoom channel and we look forward to learning with you. Okay, everybody have a wonderful night and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Sokolo. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.